All right. Well, here we are at the Threefold Auditorium in Spring Valley, New York. And who are we with? Maybe you can tell me your name first. Herbert Hawkins. Okay, are you Herbert O? I am Herbert O, Herbert o okay. Orland Hawkins. Okay, because there seem to be more than There's one. my father, Herbert H. Hawkins. Okay, well maybe we can start with him. <laughs> how did this happen? I mean, how did you come about? How did you pick somebody like that? Well, my parents met at Cornell University. Uh-huh. And then after uh, their days at Cornell, moved to New Jersey mm -hmm. and lived in Madison, New Jersey. So I was born in 1946 in Morristown. There and then go. after four years of being there, we moved back to Princeton where my father had grown up. Okay. And back to his, where his parents still were living. Was he into anthroposophy? Yes, and his parents, my grandparents, were I also anthroposophist. My grandfather even had met Rudolf Steiner wow. and had an interview with him. Wow. My grandfather was a botanist, so he was particularly interested in Steiner's indications on plants and so forth. Mm -hmm. But that's already even before World War I. Wow. Yeah. So this goes back a long way. So, so you picked a family where you could really snuggle in or something like that? In a sense, because when I was growing up, the anthroposophical group was meeting in our home there and so I was always surrounded by anthroposophists but I didn't take it up independently or freely on my own until high school. Oh, okay. And my father wanted it to be a free thing for my yeah. brother and myself and yeah. not be forced into it. Yeah, don't yeah. push. So the first little book I ever read happened to have been in the living room on the shelf. He put away all the anthroposophical books in the attic so that we wouldn't feel in any way pressured. But he forgot one little book, and it was a tiny, a tiny, a short little lecture by Rudolf Steiner called Introduction to Education. Uh -huh. And it's the lecture where he simply introduces the notion of physical, etheric, astral, ego. And um, that's what I read first. And that's, you made you, got you inspired? Yeah, to read more. Yeah. So I went to my father and said, well, what, um, what, what about should I this, read next? What about this attic? <laughs> well, the attic books, they, they came down. <laughs> but he said, well, I'm going to give you a book to read, and if you're still interested after reading through it, you can read whatever you like from the attic. So it was Steiner's autobiography oh, yeah. that he gave me. Well, you see, that's, it, that um, pictures exactly what I'm trying to do with yeah. you in the interview. Well, this, this is what I read. Yeah. And as a high school student, if you challenge them to do something like that, with the promise of something else, they'll do it. So I read it through, hardly knowing what I was picking up, but read it to the end. I actually stuck mm -hmm. with it. And then uh, could read what I wanted to. And then took up, my, I mean, I became interested in Steiner's work for the rest of the high school, but also in college, kept you know, reading and had the experience of going to the Gertiana for the first time as a child, as a 12 year old, because they were taking the urn with my grandmother's ashes to put in the urn room of the Gertiana. Okay. Since she and my grandfather were among the original members, they got that privilege, privilege to have their urns in the same urn room with Rudolf Steiner's urn. Wow. Well, those ashes have been since all buried yeah. near the Gertiana. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, then you're sort of a teenager, and what yeah. happens then? Well, in college, I had the opportunity as a senior, uh, as a major in German, to write my senior thesis on Rudolf Steiner's mystery dramas, and in the context of drama of that period, early 20th century. German drama. Mm -hmm. And since Steiner was very acquainted with drama at that time, he was a drama critic anyway, clearly there are things that he's drawn on when he composed these plays as well. Uh -huh. So that was in, that was the thesis. And I kept up my interest by joining the Anthroposophical Society, going to conferences and meetings, and then eventually was given responsibilities in the society starting with being on the Eastern Regional Council and then on the National Council, and then for a period of seven years, editing the newsletter of the Society, mm -hmm. of the Society in America. 
and continuing to enjoy visiting groups and branches and giving workshops and lecturing. That kind of work has continued, along yeah. with a 30-year career in teaching German, being a German instructor. Is that, in other words, that's how you make a living? Well, it was. Now I've shifted away from that and work full-time with our family, small family business, uh -huh. which is audio and video recording and post-production. So, but it leaves me freer to actually travel and do mm -hmm. meet with groups and members and do this so, kind of work here. So you must have been involved in, in uh, the, the movie uh, made with uh, Henry Barnes? No, that was another somebody else? group that made that. With, um, you're talking about the film that was done in, for the school in New York? or a different, well, the, uh, well, he seems to be standing near a pond. Like, uh, that, that's another production. Another production, okay. Yeah. No, our productions have been more geared toward Waldorf and you with me. Oh, okay. So that's, that's a different um, angle, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, it's, it's uh, my mm, karmic connections with people in the society and the movement really started when I taught for a year at Kimberton Farm School at that time, taught German in the high school. And it was during that year that I made all the connections that have lasted, you know, through mm -hmm. the years that mm -hmm. got me in different positions. Mm -hmm. it, for example, it led to my teaching in the summer uh, time at the Rudolf Steiner Institute when they were doing their three-week right. um, program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a big step to actually start doing giving courses on the mystery dramas yeah. and on poetry as meditation. That was another topic mm -hmm. I was working with. Mm -hmm. Still do, especially in connection with the calendar of the soul. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. Other duties that came my way were connected with threefold, where I'm on the, the threefold board. Okay. And work with that. So and keeps, you're still doing that? Still doing that, yeah. And we, um, you know, in terms of responsibilities and whatnot in the School for Spiritual Science, they um, asked me also to serve as a class holder. All right. So mm -hmm. that work also continues. Maybe you can just explain a little bit what that is, because most people on, on the internet mm. wouldn't know what that well, is. Well, Rudolf Steiner, when he kind of refounded the Anthroposophical Society in 1923, 1924, and that weekend there, mm -hmm. New Year's, also refounded or established the School for Spiritual Science, which was meant to be a place of well, not just a place, but a series of instructions for developing meditative work on a more serious, more dedicated level. Mm -hmm. So he expected people who got into what he called the first class of the School for Spiritual Science, he expected people to be really taking up the anthroposophical path of development seriously. Mm -hmm. And then for those folks, he gave a series of lectures introducing a whole series of meditations. Mm -hmm. They've mm -hmm. been published and printed, but the real activity is still when class members get together and work and, with the meditations. Yeah, yeah. Here the lectures, again, um, here class holders giving different versions of it, but trying to get deeper into mm -hmm. the material so they can more consciously work with it. So, so have there been major turning points in your life? Well, first moon note, second year, moon note, yes, something uh, like that. The 1973. I was looking at the age here when I was 27 years old. It was in that year, and into 74. That was the year I was at Kimberton. And the summer of 1973, I was over at the Gertianum working as a stagehand. Hmm. on the mystery dramas, so we produced them some four or five times during the course of that summer. Mm -hmm. So I had quite, a, quite an exposure to the mystery dramas, but from, from backstage. The you know. right, yeah. But then I could go out front and watch rehearsals, that was, yes, that was yes. good. And during that time I thought, well, me, I was having discussions with people and became a class member then actually during that summer. But I thought, oh, I want to do something more. So what I began thinking about was to become, take up the study of, of becoming a priest in the Christian community. Okay. 
And I went back home at the end of the summer and told my father that this is something I had in mind. And father said, no, you know, you can do other things in life besides that. And it kind of penetrated. So I didn't go that route. But in a sense, I've gone the route of becoming a class holder and yeah. responsible for yeah. the ritual kind of work that is also associated a bit with the class. There's not too much of that, but it is a responsibility. Uh -huh. And yeah, that, um, that's where that impulse headed. But also at Kimberton, as I already just mentioned, I made the contacts that led me into teaching at the Steiner Institute, the Summer Institute, but also then becoming recognized and asked to serve in the society. So it, mm -hmm. you, you, the, with the people that were there, it, that's how it, it branched out. So I had a moment at Kimberton at the end of that year, 1973 to 74, when I could choose to go back to public high school teaching because that was just a year's leave that I was at Kimberton, mm -hmm. stay at Kimberton, or go on with graduate work, because mm -hmm. I already had done summer work at Middlebury and gotten a master's in German. So those three, in a sense. And so I just threw my fate to the wind and I applied to Princeton University to be in their graduate program in the German department. And I thought, if I get in, I'll do that. If I don't, I'll either stay at Cambridge or go back to public high school teaching. Yeah. I got into Princeton. So I chose to continue my graduate studies in German yeah. in the PhD program. And I completed all of the exams and all the coursework, but not the dissertation. So I don't have a doctorate, but I have two master's degrees as a result of that study. And I, yeah, recognition in that way is one thing, doing the work I'm doing today. Yeah. And all of that kind of coursework does train you anyway to mm -hmm. be a scholar. And mm -hmm. I have that side to me. Yeah. I mean, uh, of course, we've experienced you a lot of times when you come to Toronto to, uh, you know, to, to be with us. So, you know, in a way, you are kind of a, like a priest going around yeah. in a way. And it's a role that I happily play, I mean, with, with joy. But it's, um, it's satisfying knowing that probably that's my path. Yeah. That's my yeah. kind of work. And yeah. I yeah. like the connections with the people. Yeah. And I'm quite sanguine. So I need to have a lot of, yeah. yes. you know, things going on. around, things going on, yeah. and, and variation. That is true. Can you can you tell us? Can you tell? Because you just told, told the audience a little bit about cell phones. Can you can you tell us a little bit about this? In other words, what you what you said this morning about cell phones? Well, it's a, again a piece of technology that's out there. It's it's becoming awfully uh, time taking of people's mm -hmm, time mm -hmm, and attention, mm -hmm. not just cell phones, but smartphones and mm -hmm, iPads and mm -hmm. whatnot. And you wonder, where is this heading when people mm -hmm. are constantly on a cell phone, whether they're out walking dangerously when they're driving, in their home, when you witness children at a dinner table at a restaurant, the children mm -hmm. are, are on their uh, mm -hmm. cell phones, texting each other, even if they're sitting next to each other. Yes, I know. Texting each other, know. not talking to each other. So it worries me a bit what's happening person to person, soul yeah. to soul, yeah. spirit to spirit. What is being cut off mm -hmm. when a technological instrument is being misused? Yeah. It's there. Yeah. You can't deny it. It's, it it's going to continue. It's useful for some things. And it just hasn't been But quite you were explaining something about some of the applications which I really enjoyed. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's only because it's out there. That you can <laughs> download applications can connect it in connection with meditative life. Exactly. Which, reminding you to meditate or what meditations to use wherever you are and so forth. There you are. If you need that kind of crutch to, to build up a meditative life, that's the positive side. <laughs> Whereas if you it's are too dependent on this and, and it's just a rote mechanical yeah. thing, then you wonder how effective it might be. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah, it's a concern. And you can have a bit of fun with, like, like we did this morning. Yeah. You certainly got everybody laughing. <laughs> well, because mm, as anthroposophists, I think we do try to be as conscious and responsible, and responsible for our inner lives without the, the technological crutches, but mm -hmm. they're there. Yeah, and, and we're using one right now. 
Yeah, so <laughs> can't deny that. It's really well, nice, thank yeah. you. I hope this was something that works for you. Oh, certainly. Good. Oh, well, sir. well, you know, like I say, people need to know the people. <laughs> well, I All right. appreciate it.